Make it all, Rex. The majestic planet capital of the Empire. From all corners of the galaxy, Imperial subjects came to find trade, power, and to pay tribute to their omnipotent master. Those who did not offer their respect were dealt with most effectively. For a time, peace and brutality held the galaxy together. But shackles were never meant to be eternal. Oppression breeds revolution, and pride, destruction. The galactic uprising deposed all semblance of order, ushering in an age of carnage. Nations and races took up arms, vying amongst themselves to claim Megator Rex for their own. In the years and wars to follow, weapons of terrible aspect were forged, exhausting resources, laying waste to eons of progress, and exterminating billions. And then, it was finished. A dark age fell upon the galaxy. Megator Rex, the seat of order and law, was laid to ruin, and what little was left of nations picked through the ash and rubble to feed themselves. But, even in the desolation, there was a spark of resolve. The clans of yesteryear were not resigned to live in the squalor of war's aftermath. They would rise again. Their armies would overcome new territory. A new day would break, and all eyes would be fixed upon the galactic throne. Pax Magnifica, Bello Glorioso. The goal of the game of Twilight Imperium is to be the first player to gain 10 victory points, or 14 victory points in a longer game. There are many ways to get victory points, but the most basic is to succeed in accomplishing objectives. But let's get things started with how to set up the game. First, choose who's going to start off the game by giving them the speaker token. Next, each player chooses a faction. Each faction has different strengths and weaknesses, so choose one that matches the tactics that you're planning on using. After choosing a faction, each player needs to collect all of the things that have the symbol of their faction on it, like their planet, their special technologies, their planet world card, and tokens, both command and control tokens, which I'll refer to as rectangle tokens and triangle tokens to make things simple. Next, it's time to choose a color and I would suggest choosing a color that matches your faction's tokens as closely as possible so people don't get confused. Your color components include your command sheet, your technology cards, your ships, and if you're using them, negotiation cards. Next up is the huge job of building the map. And though advanced players may build their own, I stick with the ones in the book. Regardless of who designs the map, the center of the map has to be Mechatol Rex, and on Mechatol Rex, you place the Custodian's Token, which gives the first player who claims Mechatol Rex one victory point. Twilight Imperium is played on a board made of hexagons, and each hexagon is a system. Some systems have planets, some systems have hazards, some have nothing at all, and some have wormholes, which allow ships to jump from one point of the galaxy to another. Once the players have finished building the board, it's time to slide in their home system. This is the system where you will be putting all of your ships that you start with. Next up, you want to shuffle the common decks, and that includes the objective decks, the agenda deck, and the action deck. The one common deck that I would not shuffle would be the planet deck. I keep that alphabetized, so then finding planets when you conquer them is really, really simple. Next, lay out the strategy cards, and make sure they're in a place where everyone can reach them. Then your players will want to flip over their faction sheet, and check the lower left corner. This tells them what they start with. This includes technologies and units. After you've collected all of your units, go ahead and put them on your home system. 
The space docks and the PDSs go on the planet, as well as any infantry that you want to station there. Every other unit goes in the outer space region. Then take three command tokens, those are the triangle tokens, and put them in your tactics slot. And then take three more, flip them upside down, and put them in the fleet slot. The number of tokens in this slot indicate how many big ships can be in each system. And finally, put two command tokens in the strategy pool. The last step in setup is preparing the objectives. Lay out five of the first tier and second tier objective cards, and then put the rest in the box. Then each player draws a secret objective, which is obviously secret. The game begins when the speaker reveals the first two objectives. These are goals that all players are trying to achieve, and they're open to all players throughout the entire game. And you are all set, ready to go for a game of Twilight Imperium. Now it's on to gameplay. The game of Twilight Imperium is played in rounds, and each round has phases. The first phase is the strategy phase, where you pick the tactic that you're going to be using throughout your turns. The players take turns drawing strategy cards, and if there are three or four players, they draw two, but if there's five or six players, they only draw one. Trade goods are placed on the ones left over, which I'll explain later. The next phase is the action phase. During this phase, players take turns taking actions, using their strategy cards to tell who goes first, and in what order. One big part of the action phase is managing your tokens. Tactic tokens are used to move and build things, and strategy tokens are used to play off other players' strategy cards. Let's say the Jolnar player wants to fly some troops to nearby planets to control them. He first has to activate the system by taking a tactic chip and laying it in the system he wants to go to. Then, provided they have enough movement, he moves the units that he wants into the system. In this case, there are no defenders, so he takes the planets no problem and collects their planet cards. Incidentally, these cards will be gained flipped upside down on their black and white side to show that they can't be used for production this turn. Sometimes a player wants to leave a planet or system without leaving any troops behind, and that's fine. If there are any planets that you control there, you put a control token on it, the rectangle tokens. It's just an easy way to tell whose planets are whose. Another action is building new ships. For that, you need a unit like a space dock that can produce things. You also need production points, which are found on your planet cards with the yellow outline. To use those production points, you flip over the card exhausting the planet for this turn. You then take a token from the tactics pool and put it in the system where you're producing things, which activates the system. The cost of units can be found on your player sheet. With three production points, the universities of Jolnar can build a cruiser and a destroyer. And so they do, placing them in the system where the production unit was. One major thing to know about activating a system is ships cannot move out of a system that is activated. Even though both of these systems were activated for different reasons, I can't move ships out of them. The first time a player tries to take over Mechatol Rex, they first have to pay six influence to remove the custodian token. A planet's influence can be found in the blue hexagon on your planet card. And to use it, just like production, you have to exhaust the cards. Once you've done that, the token is yours, and that means you get one victory point. Congratulations. An action you must take during this phase is activating the strategy card that you chose during the strategy phase. When you play your strategy action, you resolve the primary ability. Then all the other players may choose to resolve the second ability. After everyone has decided what they're doing with this strategy, then it is flipped over and it cannot be reused for the rest of the round. Some aspects of Twilight Imperium, like technology, rely completely on a strategy card. When choosing to research a technology, you're allowed to look through the entire deck and see what you can research. All of the technology decks are the same, except for the two cards that are special to your faction. Here's a basic technology card. You can see that it has a color in this corner. As you can see in this corner, there are no prerequisites to researching this technology. Some technologies require you to have researched other technologies beforehand, like this one. This one requires that you have three green technologies researched before you can research this one. The prerequisites for a technology are on the left side of the card. 
There is a way around this technology requirement, and that is planets with a technology symbol associated with it. You just exhaust the planet, and it fulfills that requirement. For example, this upgrade to fighters requires a green and a blue. We don't have any blue technologies, so we use a planet with a blue technology symbol, exhaust it, and that fulfills the prerequisites for this technology. Most technologies, when you research them, just go where you can read them. But when it comes to upgrading your spaceships, you actually place the card over the original. Let's move on to another strategy card. The construction card is like the technology card in the way that you can only build buildings by playing it. With this card, the one who plays it gets to build buildings for free. But if the other players want to build buildings, they have to pay a strategy token, which is the usual cost of activating the second ability on a strategy card. Trade is a strategy that introduces trade goods and commodities. Trade goods are things that you can use instead of production points and influence points. Commodities are objects that you can trade with your neighbors, and that turns them into trade goods. The key word here being neighbors. You have to have ships in an adjacent system. If you don't share borders, then you can't trade. And now for everyone's favorite aspect of the game, combat. Combat begins when one player moves his ships into a system that has another player's ships already in it. In other words, two different colored fleets cannot occupy the same system. They must fight. Before they do, however, they have a chance to declare a retreat. This doesn't mean that they'll retreat right away, but it does mean after the first round of combat, they have a chance to pull back before their entire forces are destroyed. In the next step of combat, players roll dice, 10-sided dice, and try to score hits on the other player's fleet. Here's how it works. On your faction sheet, you will see the stats for each of your ships. And as you may have guessed, the combat number is what's important in combat. This is the number you're trying to beat. The Dreadnought has to roll a 5 or higher, and the Destroyer and Carrier both have to roll a 9 or higher. And so combat begins. The Dreadnought rolls a 2, not beating the 5 that is required to assign a hit. Because a Carrier and Destroyer both have to roll a 9 to hit, they're going to be rolled together, and they fail. No hits were scored, so no hits are assigned. And since nobody claimed they were going to be retreating this turn, nobody does, and so another round of combat begins. No retreats are claimed, and so the Dreadnought rolls again, and rolls an 8. That means it's a hit, and we are going to represent that with a very lame graphic. The Carrier and Destroyer roll, and they don't get anything. So we move on to the next step, which is assigning hits, and the player that gets hit gets to assign where it's going, and he's going to go with the Destroyer. Probably because he wants to keep his carrier so he can keep attacking and possibly invade the planet. Blue must be feeling pretty confident, because he's not retreating. They're going for another round of combat. As our players roll again, the Blue scores a 9, which means that's a hit. And crazily, the Dreadnought misses again. The purple player has no choice but to assign that hit to his Dreadnought. But the Dreadnought isn't down and out yet, because Dreadnoughts have a special ability which allows them to take an extra hit called Sustain Damage. Again, players decide to go for another round. The Carrier misses, and the Dreadnought hits. The Carrier is destroyed, along with the infantry it was carrying. The purple player won the combat, but his Dreadnought is damaged, which means it's vulnerable, something that the green player is taking advantage of. He places his token and moves his ships in. And the green player is not messing around. He's bringing in a cruiser, two infantry on a carrier, as well as two fighters. Looking at the stats real quick, the cruiser has to roll sevens or higher to hit, and the carrier and fighters are looking for a nine or higher. Purple wants to save his dreadnought, so he calls for a retreat. But before he can get his ship out of there, he has to fight the combat. So he makes his roll. Fortunately, he rolls a 7, which is a hit. Now, since the cruiser has to roll a 7 and everything else has to roll a 9, it has to roll separately. The green player declares who he's rolling for and makes his roll. The cruiser makes a hit, and the dreadnought is destroyed, so I don't roll for the other ships. We assign the cruiser's hit to the only ship possible, the dreadnought, and take it away, and the green player assigns the hit the dreadnought made to one of the fighters. However, the green player forgot to take away his fighter model, so we're going to shame him by leaving the graphic up. 
Anyway, he moves his infantry and lands them on Mechatol Rex, looking to have some combat. Let's check on the infantry stats. Okay, so the green looks like they have to roll an 8 to make a hit, and the purples have the same stats, except they have the fragile trait for their faction, so they actually have to roll a 9 or a 10. The defenders roll their one die and get a 4, so that's not a 9 or 10, so they don't make it, and the attackers roll 8 and a 9, which both hit. The defending infantry is destroyed, and the other hit, uh, goes away. Green has successfully taken over Mechatol Rex, which means that the purple has to relinquish the card for that planet. When the green player gains the card, it is exhausted so it cannot be used this turn. But when it comes to Mechatol Rex, the victory point that comes from the Custodian's token stays with the original owner. Once all the strategy cards have been played, and all the players have decided to pass, it's time to move on to the status phase. The first order of business during the status phase is scoring objectives. A player may score one public objective and one secret objective during this phase. And when a player scores a public objective, this does not mean that other players can't score the same objective either now or later. An important thing to know is some secret objectives can be scored during the action phase instead of the status phase. But from what I can tell, the public objectives all are supposed to be claimed during the status phase. After everyone has claimed their victory points, it's time for the speaker to reveal the next objective. The next step is everyone draws an action card. So blue has one, and green has one, and purple... Oh, you've got a technology that allows you to take one more? Okay, fine, you take two. Yes, 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 you are you are very special, that's wonderful. Yep. Okay, Blue, take another one. Perhaps this would be a good time for me to explain what action cards are. Uh, action cards are cards that you can play at different times indicated on the individual card, and they usually allow you to do crazy, crazy things. Thing is, you can only have seven in your hand, so if you don't use them, you'll probably lose them. Anyway, back to status phase. Remove all command tokens from the board, and return them to your reinforcements. That's the uh, little baggie that I keep them in. But keep two out, because those go back onto your command sheet. You can place them wherever you want. In fact, after you've placed them, the next step is to rearrange things the way you want them. Next, if you have any cards that are exhausted, flip them so they're right side up again. Then do the same with damaged ships. For the last step of the status phase, return all of your strategy cards, so then they can be picked again next round. Then start up the strategy phase again, and oh yeah, agenda phase. Once the planet of Mechatol Rex has been reclaimed, it is time to add another phase to the game, where people vote on laws that will affect the rest of the game. These laws, or agenda cards, are revealed by the speaker and read aloud. Then, everyone starts voting, and the power of their votes are dependent on how much influence people want to spend by exhausting planets. This is the only point of the game where trade goods do not act as influence points, at least not directly. It's either exhaust planets, or don't vote. This is also a very good place for negotiations to occur, because here, trade goods and agreements can be exchanged without players being neighbors. In this example, the purple player got what he wanted because no one else voted against him. So, according to the law that was passed, he goes up a point. But the agenda phase isn't done yet. There are two agendas that are revealed every agenda phase. The speaker reveals the second agenda, and this one is a directive. It's a one-time thing. What's amazing about this one is it's saying to re-vote on the law that was just passed. The purple player, hoping to keep his win, throws everything he has at this agenda. But in the end, he is only able to scrape together three influence points, which is no match to the green player's six that he's able to throw down with just flipping over Mechatol Rex. Purple pleads for Blue to help, but Blue does nothing. Come to think of it, Blue looks rather rich. Where did all those trade goods come from? Looks like somebody's been doing some lobbying. So that, friends, foes, and other watchers on the internet, is Twilight Imperium. There are more rules, but they're kind of vague, and you can buy the game and learn them yourselves. This is just a quick overview to see if you would like to learn how to play this game. And until next time, this is Hogwash, 
over and out. I'll catch you later.